Hello, today I'm going to talk about light. So we'll start with what is light? You'll say, huh, light is something that enables us to see things. No, no, I am asking you, what is light made up of? Hmm, not so easy to answer now, huh? So what is light made up of? It's very difficult to answer this because it's not so, you know, it's not like an object that you can hold in hand and do experiments on stuff, right? You cannot catch light. It's very difficult to think about what light is made up of. But there are many theories and many scientists proposed different theories as to explain what light is. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to explore um, the very, we're going to go back in time and explore the first theories that came into existence. And we'll talk about these scientists who came up with them. We're going to go back all the way to 17th century. And in the 17th century, there were two people who came up with amazing theories to explain light in their own ways. The first one, if you guessed it, Sir Isaac Newton. He said light is particles. Yeah, it's made up of particles. Just like how matter is made up of small atoms. Light is no different, he says. And he used them properties of momentum. He used them properties of kinetic energy and so on and so forth. On the other hand, there's another scientist. His name is Christian Huygens. Now he's a Dutch. And so it's very difficult to pronounce his name. But I'll give you the pronunciation. It goes... Huygens! Yeah. You hear it again? Here it is. Huygens! Yeah. Now, I cannot pronounce it that way. So I'm just going to go ahead and call him Huygens. So Huygens said light is not particles, but light is wave. Uh, it's very difficult to think about that. He basically says, think about, you know, what happens if you take a stone and you drop it in a pond? Circular ripples go out, right? These are waves. He says light is just like that. They are waves. So now we have a big competition. We have to think which one is right. Whether light is waves, like Huygens is saying, or light are particles, like Newton is saying. Well, during that time, Newton was a very famous man. He had already formulated his laws of motion. He had unified uh, the concept by, the, by his unified theories by introducing the universal law of gravity. So definitely, people would agree with Newton. And so I don't think there were many people who were agreeing with Huygens. And also, there was a big problem with his wave theory. And the problem is, um, if you ask Mr. Huygens, hey, how is this light propagating again, like a wave? He said, hey, just like sound waves, you know, they are longitudinal waves. That's what he said. Mm. But the question is, what is oscillating? Now think about string. In strings, when you put it, when you, when you make a wave in a string, it's the string particles that go up and down. If you think about water, it's the water particles that go up and down. If you think about sound, it's the air particles that vibrate. The same question was, what is vibrating when it comes to light? He said, this entire universe is made of an awesome medium called as ether. And it's these ether particles that are oscillating just like sound. And it's this uh, oscillations of ether particles that is producing waves, just like what happens in air to produce sound. Now, whether ether is there or not, well, we don't know. We have to find that out now. But the question is, which theory can explain the phenomena we already know about light? So, which theory can explain reflections and refractions of light? Whichever theory does that well, I would say that's a good enough theory to go about. And that's what we're going to talk about. Which theory can explain these phenomena well? So... We have Newton's particle theory that is trying to explain all the phenomena of refraction, reflection and refraction. Let's see how Newton explains this. So let's start with reflection. To understand Newton's idea of reflection, let's take a simple example from classical mechanics. Suppose I have a wall here and a ball which has some mass m, let's say it comes and 
hits this particular wall with some velocity v. And let's say this angle of collision, I call it as angle theta. And suppose it bounces off at the same angle theta, that's a given, and with the same speed v. It is clear that the wall puts a force on that ball. But I want to know in what direction the wall puts a force. Can we do that? Yes, of course we can do that. All I have to calculate is the change in momentum. Because remember, force is always equal to rate of change in momentum. So if I calculate what direction, I don't even need to know what is the magnitude, that's not important, but I need to know what is the direction of the change in momentum, then I get the direction of the applied force. Okay, so to calculate the change in momentum, I have to subtract, uh, so basically I need to calculate what the change in momentum is, and that's going to be the final momentum minus the initial momentum. My final momentum is in this direction. So that's my final momentum. Here it is. And that is mv. Mass into velocity. And my initial momentum is in this direction. But since I have a minus sign, I'm going to flip that. So when I flip that, I get mv, which is the initial momentum vector, which has been subtracted. So it's basically a minus. So this vector is minus p of i and this vector is basically p of f. So now if I add these two, I should get what is the change in momentum. And to do that, all I have to do is a nice rectangle like so and the diagonal tells me what is the direction of change in momentum. So this is the resultant. And so this immediately tells you that the force must be in this direction because the change in momentum and the force are in the same direction. Therefore, the force exerted must be this way. Or I can also say that this object experienced an acceleration this way. And because it experiences acceleration only in this direction, the angle has to remain the same and the velocities are also same. So this is what Newton is thinking. And Newton is saying, aha! This is how reflection takes place. So Newton basically goes backwards. So Newton says, since I know in reflection the incident ray and the reflected ray make the same angle, maybe something like this is happening. So Newton, Newton's postulate is that, point number one, when light falls on a reflecting surface, he postulates that the collision between the particles and that surface is going to be a pure elastic collision so that the speed of it which bounces off remains the same. So, pure elastic collisions. The second postulate that he makes to explain reflection is he says that every time the particle bounces off a wall, a, a reflecting surface, it's going to experience an acceleration which is, uh, you know, which is a sort of repelling force and therefore it gives an acceleration which is perpendicular to the surface. So if here is this reflecting surface and if here is this beam of light which comes over here which is basically particles that's what Newton is saying then it will experience an acceleration this way and it will experience a force in that direction and since the force is perpendicular and elastic and collisions are elastic what's going to happen is it's going to bounce off making sure the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. Very clever, Mr. Newton. Very clever indeed. So that's how he was able to explain reflection by coming up with this force. He did not tell why some reflective surface put a force, but maybe he thought something like this way. Now, can he explain refraction? And more importantly, can he come up with, can he derive Snell's law? Remember what Snell's law was? So let me do that on the page for you. Remember Snell's law. Snell's law basically states that when light goes from one medium to another, it refracts, it bends. We call this as the angle of incidence, the angle of refraction, and we give this one a medium 1 which has a refractive index n1 and this is a refractive index n2 then the general Snell's law says 
that n1 sin i must be equal to n2 sin r. It's an empirical formula Snell came up with. And if you divide sin i by sin r, then you should get n2 divided by n1. So the question is, can Newton prove this using his particle theory of light? And it turns out he could. He can prove this, and that's what is interesting about his particle theory. So let's do that in a little bit more detailed and a little bit civilized manner. So suppose here is that particular interface. There it is. And streams of particles are coming over here. So here is one particle, and this is the velocity vector of this particle. Here's that particle. And let's say that velocity vector is v. It has tangential, it has two components. It has a component this way, this direction, which is the vertical component, and it has a component this direction, which is the horizontal component. And let's say the velocity is v1, which is called as v1, and therefore, if this angle is the angle of incidence over here, if this is the angle of incidence, then this must be the angle of incidence. And so now our components are going to be, this is going to be v1 cos i, and this is going to be v1 sin i. And now he says that when this particle comes very close to this surface, this refracting surface, it's going to experience an acceleration now, not upwards, but downwards. It's going to experience a force downwards, and that force is going to accelerate it downwards. And you can sort of see, because it gets an acceleration downwards, it starts now going a little bit in a different direction. And so now, the moment it enters this particular medium, it has a different velocity, it has a velocity this way, says that if this angle is angle of refraction r, so if you look at its components again, you have, this is v2, it's a new velocity because of the acceleration, and this is now v2 cos r, and this component becomes v2 sin r. But since the acceleration was downwards, and the force was only downwards, that can only change the velocity in the downward direction. This force has no effect on the velocity along the x direction, along the horizontal. And therefore, we can easily argue saying that v1 sin i must be equal to v2 sin r. Or, in other words, sin i divided by sine r equals v2 divided by v1. And bang, he proves this. He says this n2 divided by n1 must be v2 divided by v1. That's what it is. And he's saying that the refraction basically takes place because velocity of light is changing. And so he says, yeah, I have proved Snell's law. What Snell says is n2 and n1 basically is nothing but is the ratio of the velocities. And it's because of this change in velocity, we have the bending of light. And that's the proof given by Newton. Very elegant and very nice particle model of light.